I'm going to preach a message that I preached th about 35 years ago one time, and the people I preached it to never forgot it. So I'm going to hold it to you to never forget this. <laughs> Some of them quote this to me to this very day. Never settle for less when you can have God's best. Never settle for less when you can have God's best. Remember that and then apply it to everything in your life. Apply it to everything. All right? <laughs> you hear that, Bill? Yes. Never settle for it less when you can have God's best. Yes. Now, I know that you got the best end of that deal with Joanne. <laughs> and Joanne, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I know you got the best in the deal. <laughs> all right. Acts, the 26th chapter. We're going to see that all through here. Never settle for less when you can have God's best. Not in your job. Get a job you like. Your life, your marriage, your religion. Your baptism, church membership, all of this. Remember that. Now, as we go, we're going to look at all of this, okay? <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, what does Paul mean? Shorty. Shorty. Little short guy. Short guy. Now, his name, uh, what was his, what was his or original name? Oh. Saul, which means one ask for. One ask for. And verse 26 and verse 1, and Agrippa said to Paul, what about Agrippa? Remember what Agrippa means, uh, uh, Christine? Agrippa. How about it, Brother Roger? Uh, Sharon, you got that one on the tip of your tongue? No? <laughs> Bill, you ought to remember this. What does Agrippa mean? Oh, I know what it means. Yes. A wild horse trainer. A wild horse trainer, a bronc buster. That's what it means, to train wild horses. Agri and hippos, remember? Agrippa. To train wild horses, and he said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand. Did you ever hear the story about the two Jews on New York City when it was like 40 below zero? They were standing out in New York City, and they just standing there with their hands in their pocket looking at each other. And one of them finally said, why don't you say something? He said, you talk. Freeze your own hands. <laughs> so here we have Paul with his hand out. Before he can say one word, that hand's got to be up there. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense, his uh, apology. All right, what was apologetics? His defense. And I'm going to be reading this from Greek a little bit, so if you have a Greek Bible or whatever, you can look at it as we go. <clears throat> it is permitted. He said, he said to Paul, uh, uh, it is permitted for you to speak for yourself. For yourself. Uh, concerning all things of which you're being accused by the agency of the Jews. And then he says, Basileu, Basileu. That's vocative singular masculine, Brother Roger. What does that mean? Melek? King. King Agrippa. King Agrippa. Uh, I consider myself uh, happy. I consider myself happy. Uh, before you concerning, I consider myself ha happy in regard to all things I am accused of by the Jews. I consider myself fortunate, happy. King Agrippa, for I'm out, about to make my defense before you today. Now, Paul is going to use this opportunity to do what? What's he going to use the opportunity to do? Preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. And he's going to do this. And what is this Agrippa here? He's a king, isn't he? Over who? The Jews. He's a Jewish king. He's one of the, one of the kings over the different parts of Herod the Great's empire. Okay? 
especially because you are an expert in all customs. You know, these Herods tried to say that they were related, uh, they, were, they were Jewish. Some of them even married Jewish wives and claimed it through their wives. But they tried to claim a heritage into the Jewish nation. And they studied the Jewish laws, especially because you are an expert in all the, look at that word there. You are an expert in all of the customs. All the questions, the ethnone, ethnone, or ethone, ethone, that means all the ethnic background, and all of the, uh, of the zealous questionings that the Jews, when a Jew sets down, Brother Roger, what do they do? Have a discussion. They have a discussion, which we would call an argument. They argue over the smallest little jots and tittles of, of whatever. You're, uh, you're an expert in the customs and the questioning and the debating among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Listen to me patiently. So then all the Jews know my manner of life from my youth. All the Jews do. Up which from the beginning was spent among my own nation, my own ethnic background. The Apostle Paul was born in where? What? Tarsus, yes, Tarsus, Tarsus, and he was a free Roman citizen because his mother and father were both free Roman citizens, and a Roman citizen could legally only marry another Roman citizen because then your children would be free. Otherwise, you, if you marry a, a non-Roman citizen, your children would not be all free, would they? In other words. And at Jerusalem, his own nation in Tarsus and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time previously, if they are willing to testify that I lived, I practiced my living, my lifestyle as a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? That comes in the, the Hebrew word what? Brother Mike? Sharon? It means to separate. Peleg. 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 It means to separate. They were such a highly religious group that they separated themselves from everybody else and said, we want the best. And they made up their own laws, hundreds of laws. How many laws, Brother Roger? 612. 600 and 611, 612 laws extra besides the law of Moses. They had more rules than anybody. Just remember this. Don't settle for less when you can have God's best. That wasn't God's best. They were religious. It's a good religion to live by, but it's not a good one to die by, okay? You can live by it, and you can be a better person. You can be a Buddhist and, and, and live a better life, but it's not worth a hoot to die by when you can have God's best, when you can have the truth. According to the strictest sect of our religion, he was a zealot. What was the zealots? What were they called? The zealots. What? The Sakari. These were the political, they were political. Now I want you to understand this also. I'm doing a study on the kingdom of God and I'm doing God's eternal purpose on, on Tuesday and we bring in a lot of this stuff and, and uh, about the kingdom of God and studies and about God's person. But there's ideas in the world. The Roman Catholic Church borrowed what? When they evolved into Catholicism as we know it today, where were they borrowing their ideas from? Their ideas of the kingdom. Where did they borrow from? Islam? Huh? From Islam? No. Oh. Islam borrowed it also. Oh. These are people borrow things. The Roman, the Roman government. Where did the, where did the Roman Catholic Church get their traditions and their idea of the kingdom? The pagan religion? No, not necessarily. From Israel. Israel. Now, was Israel a theocracy? In all reality, what is a theocracy? The government ruled by the church. God, the government, the people ruled by God. Okay? And so, we have Augustine in the city of God. And from Augustine onward, we have the Catholic Church becoming the church state. 
and we're, we're going to regulate religion and politics, and it's all going to become one thing. Was that the way Israel was? And we have replacement theology, which does the same thing, doesn't it? Replacement theology takes all the promises of Israel and all of the church state. Did Calvin know anything besides church state? Did Luther know anything besides church state? Did Henry VIII know anything besides church state? That's it. Now, we live in a democracy today in churches. True New Testament churches are a democracy. Now, let's look at that. That's the kind of thing that the Lord started. Each church is independent of all other churches, isn't it? Each church is independent. They only answer to who? Jesus. They only answer to Jesus. All right, they only answer to Jesus. Now, Jesus called out his church, didn't he? And when in his during his ministry, he called it out from the Sea of Galilee, and he called it out, and he called it an ecclesia. Ecclesia in Spanish, ecclesia. Okay. What does that ecclesia mean? What did it come? Was that a new term? Did he invent a term? Where did it come from, Sharon? Um, <coughs> the only word is, when the Greeks would have their That's cities, right. It's Greek all, city states, yeah. and those free cities made up their own, they, they elected their own people, and it was like the Greek Empire was like a whole lot of little, each city-state made, it elected its officials, Ecclesia was the ones that were elected and called out, and they ran that little country right there, they had a draft, they had taxes and everything, but they did it themselves. It was like a nation within a nation. So each New Testament church is like that. But Catholicism took that away. And Catholicism said the church was always visible. That's true. The church is visible and local. But what does the word Catholic mean? Universal. The universal. They got the idea of the universal visible church, and the head of it is in Rome. Okay? And they carry the keys of the kingdom. Do you understand this? And they have, through all of these people, they believed that the church, through Augustine, from there on down, that the church, the sacraments of the church, were that they were uh, what we call sacraments that were necessary to salvation, weren't they? You almost listen to Augustine sometimes. You think he believes in salvation by grace but it was administered only through the church. If you weren't a member of the church, you couldn't go to heaven. You couldn't be in the city of God. And there's where we have Augustine. We have all of these down through the ages, and they have this church-state idea. That's not God's best, is it? God's churches were democracies. And so many churches today, when they get big, they quit being democracies. When you go off in the little Baptist churches, different places, and you go in there, when somebody comes forth and be saved, they'll, they'll make a motion. If the person wants to be baptized, I'll make a motion to accept them, their profession of faith, and, that after, and after baptism, they'll have full rights and privileges of the church, and somebody will second it, and the church will vote on it. Everything that they do, anything they buy, if it's napkins or whatever, the church votes on it. As a body, that's a democracy. But as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, we have groups of Baptists in America that are what we call uh, Bible Baptists. And in Bible Baptist groups, uh, they change the polity of the church, the polity of the church. The pastor is the head, and the, he makes all the decisions in the church. Is that a democracy? No. That's almost like a hierarchy, isn't it? Let's go on a little bit further. I'm just throwing a few of these things out here as we as we go here when we see. We can settle for less or we can take God's best, can't we? Do we need to settle for less? No. Let's go on a little bit further. I was a Pharisee, the strictest sect. I tried to do God's best. I tried to be up there high. Remember? In his life, in his job, a Pharisee had to have, be a, a workman, didn't he? 
He had to have a life. He had to, he had to be married. He had to have children that he was raising in the faith. Whatever. He had to do all these things. And they were pillars of society, were they not? But we find out they're the richest ones, aren't they? And they also believe that God, if you're not rich, that God is not blessing you. That's their idea, isn't it? If you're poor, well, God wanted you poor. Israel was supposed to pick up the poor and, and hold them up instead of push them down and step on them and use them. Israel was supposed to break down society where they didn't have the poor. And, and how long could you keep a person if you got in bad shape and you had to, uh, had to, he had to sell himself into slavery? How long could he stay in slavery? Only seven years. Only seven years. That he was a free man. Why? So he could be free again. So he could be free again. And now I am standing on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Paul said, he's, and he's talking about the hope. What is that hope? Acts 26 and verse 6, Dr. John. 26 and verse 6. What's the hope? What was the hope? The hope of the resurrection? The hope of the Messiah. Oh. The hope of the resurrection and the hope of the Messiah. What was all Israel doing? Looking for the Messiah. They are always looking for the Messiah. They, they were looking for the hope. Yeah, they were looking for that hope. The Messiah that would bring in their kingdom, remember? The promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. They earnestly serve God night and day, but they've settled for less. What happened? When the Messiah King came, Jesus offered them and he showed and displayed to all of them all of the uh, luxuries of the kingdom of God. Did he produce bread for them and fish and all that? Did he uh, heal the sick? These are what we call sample cases of millennial blessings. Did he do all these things? Yes, he did. And he said, this is what you can have right now. And they said, what? Away with him, away with him, away with him, away with him. They wouldn't accept him at all. Was he of the right lineage? According to the law? Yes. Yeah. He said, I serve God tonight, and for this hope, O king, I am being accused by the Jews. I was looking for the Messiah. Why is it considered incredible? Look at that number eight there. Why is it incredible? That word there, it means unfaithful. It literally is a peace stone. <coughs> unfaithful. What in the world does unfaithful mean? How could it be incredible to be unfaithful? How do we look at God? How are we saved? By grace. When you take the grace away, what is it? It's not a reality anymore. Unreality, unfaith, incredible. Religions, all religions are an act of faith, aren't they? Unfaithful, irreligious, irreligious? Why is it considered irreligious among you people if God raised the dead? Unfaithful, ridiculous? Something that can't happen? What did God do to Enoch and Elijah? He took them out. That's a type of the rapture in the Bible, and it? it's a type of rapture. So we have two examples of the rapture. Verse number nine. So I thought to myself, that I had to do many things. Uh, look at that ver verse number nine there. I indeed I thought to myself that for the name that I might do many things contrary, contrary to the name of Jesus the Nazarene, hostile to him, that I'm going to do a lot of hostile things to him. Did the Sanhedrin court, was Paul on the Sanhedrin court? He was one of the officers of the Sanhedrin court. Do you think that he might have had something to do with the crucifixion of Christ? It's a possibility. It was his family especially. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority 
from the chief priest, but also when they were being put to death. Now this can be used two different ways. How did, they, how did they put people to death? How did the Jews put people to death? How was the only way? Stoning. What? Stoning. Oh. Stoning. At this time, they only allowed them to stone. I want you to look at this closely. When they were being put to death, I cast my stone against them. That's Cephas right there. That's the word Cephas. Cephas means what? A little stone. Cephas. That's, that's Aramaic, Syriac word, okay, Cephas. It comes right into Greek. It says Cephas in Greek. It starts, it, it's like this. It starts with this, Cephas, Cephas, Cephas. And then in uh, Greek, it is what? Petros, Petros. Now let's look at this. <coughs> now... <coughs> The Catholic Church is settled for less. Did you know that? When they could have God's best. Who do they say is the, the rock on who the church is built? Peter. 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 Cephas. Now, in this Sanhedrin court, they had stones, didn't they, Brother Roger? And they had black ones and white ones. The black one was to condemn. The white one was to say he's, he's innocent. Now, you could use this two different ways. Who was the man that, that when Stephen was, was murdered by the Sanhedrin court, who was the man that stated the sentence? Who stated his sentence of death? The Apostle Paul did. He was the executor of that, uh, what we call execution. Paul was. Now just look at this for a minute. Now, he, this could have been two different ways. Either he took a black stone and cast his stone against those, these people or he could have taken a Cephas, a stone that you can throw and hit them with it in the execution. Cephas means Cephas. It means stone. By the way, the Catholic Church said Peter was the first pope and he's a, he's a person, Matthew 16 and 18, upon this rock I'd be building my church upon this stone. He said, Jesus said, you are Peter Petros, a little stone. But upon this gigantic Petra, I shall be building my church, and the gates of hell shall not wrestle her down. Now, the Catholic Church has decided to settle for less because they settled for a pebble instead of the rock of Israel. Did they not? A pebble instead of the rock of Israel. Now, that religion is okay, isn't it? It's accepted by the world. It's one of the most largest religions in the world, and you can live by it. But you better not die by it because you've settled for less when you can have the truth, God's best. Let's go on a little further. I cast my stone or my vote against them or my stone, literally. And I'm sure he did both. And I punished them often in the synagogues. I tried to force them to blaspheme. And what is blasphemy? Huh? Okay. Now, what does the name Jehovah mean? What does the name Jehovah mean? He who shall become. All right. Who's Jesus? Jehovah. The Bible calls Jesus the Word of God, doesn't it? The Word, the Word, the Word there means Havavar or the Jehovah. You know, in the Old Testament, Exodus 20 and verse 7, and I've said this a thousand times, when Israel received the law and it said, Thou shalt not use the Lord thy God's name in vain, for he will not hold you guiltless, you will not be forgiven. They never used his name. They never spoke that name again. So they ha the bar or Hashem. Never again. When John wrote, well, John 1 and 1, NRK ain't ho logos, in the beginning, kept on being the Jehovah or the Word. He was using the Hebraism. 
Now the Apostle Paul was trying to say, to make these people say that Jesus isn't the King of Israel, that he isn't Jehovah, that he isn't God, and that he isn't God the Son. Now what is that? That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Blasphemy. I punish them often in the synagogues. I try to force them to blaspheme to say Jesus wasn't God. And became furiously, and I was insanely mad at them. Look at that word. Imanomenos. We get a word maniac from that. Mania, maniac. When you go into manic episode, what happens? You flip out, don't you? A manic episode is flip out. I remember one time in history, Audie Murphy had a real, real close friend in the Army. Real, real close friend. And he went through a lot of battles with him and everything. And one time he was, they were taking out machine gun nest. And this guy, Laddie Tipton was his name. He stood up and they shot him down, just cut him down with a machine gun. He died in Audie Murphy's arms. And he got, Audie Murphy got up in a manic episode grabbed his gun, and took out seven machine gun nests in a row. Crazy. How did he do it? How did he do it? He said he looked back, he didn't know how he did it. He was just not there. He said it was like I was another person. I was killing, I was a killing machine. I was enraged. I was in a manic episode against them. I was insane. <laughs> with my religious retribution. I kept pursuing them. I kept on pursuing them even unto foreign cities. He went all over the place, didn't he? Not even the same nation. Different nations. He was chasing them all over, as far as he could go. While thus engaged and enraged, okay, while thus engaged and enraged, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority, the exousia, and commission of the chief priest. What authority was that? To arrest and kill. Oh. To arrest and kill. Now at midday, O king, it says here, but look at it in Greek for just a moment. Verse number 13. Verse number 13. In day mid. All right. In the middle of the day, I saw king out of heaven. That's what it literally says. I saw a king out of heaven. That word king there, Basileu, is in the vocative singular masculine. So we can say that it was Agrippa, O king, out of heaven, or I saw the king out of heaven. Which of them, what, which, I mean, we can use that to mean Agrippa also, but did he see the king of heaven? Who is the king of heaven? Jesus. Jesus is the king of heaven. Out from heaven. Above, in the lamprotata, lamprotata. What is lamprotata? What do you think that comes? What English word comes from lamprotata? Lamp, lamp. Huh? Light. Light. Lamp. Lamp. A shining lamp. And this word here is the lamps that they used. Uh, remember when the Greeks and the Romans had a theater? And people would get up there, and they would have lights. And back at that time, we have candle lights, or we have uh, whale oil lights, or we have olive oil lights, and they have a shiny, polished mirror. And that's what he said he saw. A lamp protata. A lamp uh, like the sun, brighter than the sun, beyond the sun, hyper, beyond the sun shining around me, a light. It was shining around me and the ones journeying with me. 
Verse number 14. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying in the Hebrew dialect, and actually that's what it is, the Hebrew. The Hebrews were speaking. They say, this is not biblical Hebrew. This is what kind of language, Brother Roger? Aramaic. Aramaic. He, uh, he's quoting Aramaic here now. Now, he quoted a little Aramaic before, didn't he, when he said Cephas, didn't he? Cephas. Uh, in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Here's the king of heaven now. Here's Jesus, and he's, he's a, addressing Paul. Or Saul. Saul. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin, which what? Was Saul from the tribe of Benjamin? The first king of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin? Did Saul have a royal heritage from the tribe of Benjamin? All right. He did. The wolf. In the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you in verse number 14. Why are you uh, chasing me down? Why are you chasing me like a hound? Remember what Benjamin was like? He was like the wolf. Like the wolf. What does a wolf do? Chases his prey. Chases his prey. Chasing his prey. Sclerone. We have a muscular, muscular, or uh, Arterial sclerosis. What's arterial sclerosis? Comes right out of this word. Arterial sclerosis. I got it good right now from arsenic. <laughs> huh? Why? Yeah. Your arteries become hard. Your arteries come hard. All right. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. What is a goad? What's a goad, Brother Mike? It's what? What is a goad? Okay. Now let's just think about it. What did they use in cattle trucks and cattle moving and all that stuff? What did they use? To, what is the goad that they use? Yeah, a stun gun thing or huh? a cattle prod. A cattle prod. Now back then they used a sharp stick. It was a very sharpened stick that they would poke right at the a cow's walking like this and they hit him right here in the leg. And then the cow would move that leg on up there, boy, and get moving. Now a long time ago, out there at uh, Old River and uh, Bear Mountain Boulevard, there was an old ranch out there. Yeah, what was the name of that ranch, Marilyn? Lakeside. The Lakeside Ranch. I worked on that Lakeside Ranch about 1950-something. I was a horse trainer. And there was an old boy out there that was just rough, rough. That's all I can say. He was one of the greatest horse trainers in the world, but he was a rough man. He was a hard drinker, hard fighting, old cowboy. His name was Harry Rhodes. And he had some of the best horses in the world. He, there he, he had Johnny Tibio. He, that horse is a legend. And he had Lucky Buck, and that horse is a legend. My stepdad rode Lucky Buck when he was 22 years old in Cow Palace and won second in the world on him in the cutting horse. Second in the world. Well, I was out there, and old Harry, he liked me. I was a very quiet Indian boy. And I worked like a, a slave. And uh, he had a black uh, groom there named Gumbo. His name was really Jim, but they called him Gumbo. Gumbo means black mud, you know. He'd get old Gumbo in that tack room, and he'd get that cattle prod. He said, please, Mr. Harry, please, Mr. Harry, don't hit me with that thing, Mr. Harry. Don't hit me with that thing, Mr. Harry. And he'd punch him right in the belly with it, and he'd just scream. Get him in there. And he did the same thing to me sometimes. He liked to use that hot shot. Those stallions that we had there, boy, oh, they were rough. I've seen him bend a one-inch pipe over the back of some of those stallions. They were killers. They're like grizzly bears. Big jaws and teeth. If you want to see what a grizzly, one of those things can do to you, see my ear right there cut half in two? One of them stallions bit me and stomped me half to death, broke my skull and my neck and stomped me half to death. They're like grizzly bears, boy. They're strong. And about the only way to get their attention is hit them something with something bigger than they are. Or a hot shot. It'll get their attention. It'll get their attention. Now let's go back to Paul. 
Now let's see an illustration of what the Lord is saying. Jesus is saying this to Paul. He's saying this to Paul. He said, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. God was trying to give Paul his best. Did you know that? All of his life he was trying to get. How do you think Paul was ever convinced or convicted to do anything he ever did? By the Holy Spirit of God. But he start, stopped following the Holy Spirit of God and he started following that manic, Adamic nature that means to kill and destroy. And that's what he did. And God is convicting that man now. He's convicting him hard. He stops him. He blinds him. And the God of heaven speaks to him from heaven. And he said, Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. Now just think about this. You're a cow going down the road. Sharon, Roger, you're going down the road. And somebody hits you with a, with a hot shot. Instead of jumping away from the hot shot, what do you do? You jump right into it. Do you understand that? It's hard for you to kick against them. Why are you hurting yourself, Paul? Why do you keep on fighting me? Why are you kicking? Why are you setting for less when you could have God's best? Why are you doing this? Why are you kicking against my prodding? Just go. Go, Paul. Don't kick back. Go. When a, when a cow would do that, when they kick against the gold, what would happen? They would be impaled with the gold. They would injure themselves. They would injure themselves in their rage and their stubbornness. Verse number 15. And I said, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Look at that. Who are you, Lord? Who are you? Tis a kidie. Tis means who. That's a what we call an interrogative pronominal adjective. Who are you? Who do you keep on being, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are chasing down. You're chasing down like a wolf, Paul, like a hound. You're chasing me down like a hound. You're hounding me. I am Jesus, whom you are chasing down. But arise. And stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you. To appoint you to greater things. I'm going to point you to the best. Don't settle for less when you can have God's best. You've had less. Now let's get into the church. Let's just see what you can do there. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to point you a, uh, an under roar is what it literally says. An under roar. That wasn't a high term. What was an under roar? How about these old Roman ships and the Greek ships? What were they? Who powered those ships? Slaves. 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 And they were chained for their lives. How many of you saw the movie Spartacus? Spartacus was a slave, and, and when you were totally condemned to the worst thing that you could condemn, uh, it, it was some ways worse than crucifixion. They took you and they chained you to a seat and a row in a ship, in a warship. Now, first of all, a warship is a place of what, Brother Roger? Intense, uh, confinement. intense confinement and danger. Yeah. You're intense confinement, but you're in danger all the time because these are warships. So you're always what? On the front line, so to speak. So you're in danger from without and you're being abused and horrified and persecuted and used up inside. They would give them just enough food to live. They had to urinate and defecate right where they were. These were stinking places. This was not a good place to live. When you were chained to those oars, that was the end of your life. Okay? Paul says, I'm going to make you an under roar. <laughs> Or the Lord told Paul, I want to make you, I want to, I want to put you in the, in the midst of all the battles. Was he going to be in the midst of all the battles? Was he going to be on the lead ship? Yeah. And as a martyr, 
Look at the word witness. I mean, it means martyr. What's a martyr? Somebody that dies for what they believe. Paul, I'm going to turn you in from a persecutor into the persecuted. Not only to these things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear, which I will appear to you. Verse number 17 now. <clears throat> Delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. From the Jewish people. The Jewish people hated Paul. They hated him. Did they? They followed him from place to place. They had followed him. They killed him. They stoned him to death one time, and the Lord raised him up, didn't he? Was he really an under rower? Was he really in that ship for good? Was he chained to that oar? Did Paul like being chained to that oar? He loved it. He said, if my Lord suffers, I will suffer. Whatever. He was choosing God's best. He was a rich man before, a high-flying Pharisee. Everybody looked up to him in the whole city where he lived. His family were the upper escalon, the upper middle class, and now he becomes dirt. But he's settled for God's best, even being in dirt. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles, to the dogs. <laughs> I'm going to send you to the dogs. Do you understand some of the... Uh, of the figurative language here. And to open the eyes so that they may turn from darkness, gotia, darkness, to light from dominion of Satan, the dominion. Do we live in, in the dominion of Satan today? Yeah, we do. Oh, boy. We have to fight this every day, don't we? Is there a day you don't have to fight this, Brother Mike? We have doubts in our minds. We have confusion, tribulation in our hearts and our spirits. We do all the time, don't we? Tribulations in this dark, dark world. In this dark, dark world. The dominion of Satan. Or that they may be of forgiveness, the sending away of sins, and an inheritance. And these are those dogs, those Gentile dogs. Remember when that woman came to Jesus one time, that Syrophoenician woman, and, and she wanted the Lord to heal her daughter. Remember that? Or her son. And, and, and she says, uh, please, Lord, please, Lord. He said, what? I haven't come to the dogs, but I've come to the lost sheep of Israel. And she said, what? But even the puppies, the little puppies, eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he said, I haven't seen such faith. Now here we have a Pharisee dog, a wolf, a ravaging wolf on the scent of God's people. And God's going to change his heart. And God's going to turn him in from a, from a persecutor to the persecuted. And Paul's going to taste what he had given out. He's going to taste that. I'm going to give you an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Sanctified by faith. I want you to think about this. Roger, when the Lord sees you, what does he see? Well, because of uh, forgiveness, he sees me in a much better light than I am. <laughs> Brother Mike, when the Lord sees you, what does he see? What? Huh? <laughs> Brother David, when the Lord sees you, what does he see? right he sees the blood of Jesus the Lord forgives you you are forgiven for all of your past sins all of your present sins and all the sins you're ever going to forgive ever going to be commit in your life that's the grace of God that's the grace of God that's the best that's the best you can settle why settle for a religion that you have to just keep on poking along Jehovah Witness has got to go out every Saturday don't they the, the Muslims got to pray five times a day in Arabic. They, gotta, they may not know what they're saying, but they got to pray in that language five times a day. They got to give their offerings. They got to do this. They got to do that. They got to fast for a whole month. But their fasting is not the fasting that we fast. You fast uh, 
when you fast, you are fasting, don't you? But they fast in the daytime and they eat at nighttime. And their food bills are more in the month of Ramadan than it is any other month because they eat more food. They have feast every night after dark, but they suffer all day long and don't eat. Fasting. That's not fasting, people. They are settling for less when they have could have God's best. The Savior that they deny, the Savior said, Oh no, he's not the Son of God. Oh no, God has no Son. There is no God but Allah. That's the blasphemy. That's the blasphemy that Paul prayed one time. He said, Jesus is not the God, God the Son. He's not. And he tried to make the church members say that, they, that he was not the Son of God. He tried to get them to blaspheme. Those who have been sanctified, there is not one part of your spirit and your soul that is not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ ever when you're born again. We are, we are sinners by nature, aren't we? Absolute sinners. Verse number 19, Consequently, King Agrippa, I, do not, I did not prove disobedient, unpersuaded. That's what he meant. He said, I wasn't unpersuaded to the heavenly vision. Look at that. I wasn't unpersuaded to the heavenly vision. That the heavenly, Uranio, o, Optasia, the heavenly vision. I was not unpersuaded. But I kept on declaring both to those at Damascus first, also those at Jerusalem, then throughout the region of Judea, even unto the Gentile, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Deeds appropriate to repentance. What is that? Walk off and leave less and choose God's best. All of those Jews that were even saved, did they still want to hold on to what was less? Did they still want to hold on to Judaism? If you look all the way down to the ages, we see one thing. We see God leading man to that cross. Every one of those things, what did every sacrifice in the Old Testament stand for? All the way from the Garden of Eden. It stood for Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ died for the sins of all mankind, but it's only efficacious to those that choose the best. You can play around in false religions. You can go to the Mormon church. You can go to Catholic. You can go and become a Muslim and throw away your lives. You can, die by the, you can live by these religions, but you better die by the truth because it's a long time in eternity. And having <clears throat> Damascus first, repent and do deeds appropriate to repentance. Verse number 21, For this reason some Jews have seized me. They snatched me away in the temple, and they tried to tear me apart, is what he said, with their hands. They tried to tear me apart with their hands. Have you ever seen somebody so mad that they just tried to rip somebody apart? Chew their ears off, chew their nose off, poke their eyes out, tear them up, bite them. That's what they did to Stephen, remember? That's what they tried to do here. It, the word care is in that word, tear apart with their hands. They tried to tear me apart with their hands. And so having attained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and to great, to kings and to anybody that will listen. Stating nothing what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. What is all that Old Testament given to us for? What was the Old Testament given to us for? To lead us to Christ. The law was what? To show them they were helpless. That something had to die for them. And they had to come, and the, and the father of the family had to confess on the, on the head of that lamb every day on Yom Kippur, every year, and he would confess everybody's sins, and every boy and girl had to tell their daddy everything they did. Every thought they had, everything they did, they had to tell them. They had to do it. If you didn't do it, what happened? That sin was going to be held against you. 
you would be, it would be held against you. So they had to confess to their father. And the father went out there and he had to confess it to the priest. Every year. And then when that would happen, they'd cut the, the little lamb's throat, the innocent lamb that was led to slaughter. And he didn't know what was going to happen to him. This led to slaughter as a, as a little pet. And lead him up there, slit his throat, and his life would be, blood would be taken out. And they would be forgiven for a few moments because it all starts over again, doesn't it? When you got saved, when did you start sinning again? Huh? When did you start sinning again after you got saved? That day. That day. Don't think about it. It's accounted to unto Christ. Every time you sin, it drives those nails deeper into Christ's hands. That sword deeper into his heart. Those lashes harder on his back. Every time. So I obtained help from God. I stand to this day testifying both the small and the great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses have said was going to take place. That the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. You know when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he died for Gentiles and Jews both, didn't he? It, the, 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 the veil of the temple was rent, and the holy place, the holy of holies was just there. When you die today, even though you're a saved sinner, where do you get to go? Right into that beatific vision, right into heaven itself, right into Uranus. Hashemayim. We go right there. Why? What's the ticket? Not your good works. It's the best. God's best. Don't settle for less when you have God's best. God's best was Jesus Christ. God's best is He died for our sins. That's the God's best. Go on a little bit further. That he should be first to proclaim to the light to both the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Verse number 24, and while Paul was saying this, in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. Now, he was a very educated people. He said, uh, you are a mania. Mania? You are temporarily mad. Do people go crazy sometimes? Do they lose their minds? That happens. And that's what he said to him. You lost your mind. You know what you know what Agrippa was doing? He was making his choice. He was choosing less instead of the best. He was. He was choosing less instead of the best. And wasn't this the man that he spent two years later talking to or something? No, this is this is right here. We all of these people, he spent two years in Caesarea now. And this is one of the men that stood there. It changed. They changed uh, uh, pro councils and all that during this period of time. He just kept meeting more, kept on preaching more. And Paul said to him, I'm not out of my mind. I'm not main of my most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence. Festus has chosen what? Less. Just look at the choices these people are making. Look at the choices they're making. Festus chose less. Agrippa chooses less. I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a dark corner, undercover, apocalyptic. King Agrippa, do you believe? Boy, look at this. Have you ever preached like that to somebody? Have you ever tried to lead somebody to the Lord? Sharon, have you had somebody write to the point of salvation sometime? And, and do you believe? Have you, Christine, have you had somebody like that? Have you had somebody right there, Dr. John? I know you have. Do you believe, Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. 
You believe the prophets. And Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me also to become a little Christ. That's what he said, a little Christ. A Christonio, a little Christ. What is a little Christ? Someone that follows Christ. This is one of the first places in the Bible the word, the word Christian is used. Did you know that? Right here, a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that whether in a short or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these chains. People have heard these verses preached for nearly 2,000 years, haven't they? Since that time. Have they heard Paul's words? And the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them what does the Bernice mean, remember? Victorious. Her name today would be Victory or Victoria. And when they had drawn aside, they kept on talking to one another, saying, This man is not uh, guilty of anything. He's not worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if, it had not been, if he had not appealed to, appealed to Caesar. Had these people, what had they done? Had they chosen God's best or had they settled for less? What did they do? What have you done today? Have you chosen God's best or have you settled for less? In your job, your life, your marriage, your religion, baptism. Baptism. Baptism is important, isn't it? Real scriptural baptism is really important. Church membership is important. What is the closest thing to God's heart in eternity? What's going to be the closest thing? The bride, the bride of Christ. Now, to be eligible to be in the bride of Christ, what do you do? You have to be scripturally baptized, scripturally baptized, and you have to be a member of a New Testament church, and you have to serve the Lord how? Huh? With everything, all you have all you have that's not salvation it's not salvation we're not talking about salvation all those things that you've done for the Lord in your life you're going to be rewarded for but you can choose God's best I can't tell you you're going to be there I can't say I'm going to be there but the goal is being the bride of Christ that should be in every man's heart in being that bride but to be in that bride what do you have to do you have to choose God's best. Choose his best. That's something in you. Choosing his best. Giving your all. Have you chosen your best in life? Have you chosen the best mate you could have chosen? Have you chosen the best job you could have? Are you serving the Lord like you should in his church? Has he got all of you or part of you? Have you chosen God's best? Thank you. Go out and do something eternal.